So the story of Tobilk Winery begins with the land and the river. This is a place known as Tobilk Tobilk, place of many waterholes in the language of our indigenous tribes, the Turongarong clans. They're the first people and it's a name with, which aptly describes the landscape. This is our winery here on the screen. Established in 1860, we believe Tobilk is the most beautiful and historic family owned winery in Australia located on, one, on the nation's most premium viticultural areas, and the property itself is 1,200 hectares of rich river flats with frontage of 11 kilometres of Goulburn River and eight kilometres of permanent backwaters and creeks. In 2014, Tobilk became a carbon neutral winery, recognising that we are ultimately farmers whose products are affected by a changing climate, further restoring the delicate balance only once known by the Turungarung. Our promise to our customers is the creation of iconic wines and experiences worth sharing which celebrate our history and commitment to a sustainable legacy for future generations to come. My name's Hayley Purbrick. I'm the fifth generation of the Purbrick family um, and Tobilk Winery. I've been working at Tobilk for the past eight years. And um, as people who are born into family businesses know, while I've been there for eight years, I've been there my whole life. So it's something that I hold really close to my heart. And I'm very lucky to be able to explore the full extent of my passion for a healthy environment and shaping the business to stay relevant in the modern age. So I'm a little bit of a jack of all trades. So uh, we're gonna go everywhere with this, bringing in all of my experience across continuous improvement, innovation, marketing, branding, sustainability. So prepare yourselves. Okay. So this is a pretty diverse topic and we're not here to talk about me. We're here to talk about can digital marketing or can digital technology transform farm marketing and innovating for sustainability and profit. So there's a lot that we could talk about today. But I wanted to start by exploring what is digital technology we're all rushing ahead to be more digital, but what exactly does that mean? Everyone has a different definition inside their business, and it's important when you start on this journey to define what does it actually mean to you as an organisation. And for us, when we talk about digital internally, we're talking about data. And we combine the word with technology we're talking about applying advanced computer systems to be able to turn that data into meaningful decision making quicker than a human can turn it into meaningful decisions. So it's, make, it's for us as an organisation, it's enabling us to make decisions faster than we ever had before. And marketing. Now this is an interesting one. Marketing is a word we love to throw around the place and uh, this is traditionally the art of selling something. Um, now we view it as the art of buying something. So it's no more about pushing your product onto people and assuming they'll buy it because there's not a lot of competition around. It's about convincing our customers that it's worth buying. Um, they just won't, they're not into selling anymore. And this is a point that businesses are really struggling to distinguish between. What percentage of your sales are linked to your brand value and what percentage is linked to your marketing? Brand, to us, is everything that's left when marketing has left the room. So regardless of whether you're talking marketing or branding, undoubtedly, digital technology has greatly enhanced our ability to better understand our customers' needs, their buying behaviour, and it's enabled us as a business to create marketing content and brands which are more relevant. So from a marketing perspective, this is where we're going with digital technology. It's that personalization, one-on-one -on -one, um, conversations that you can have with your customer that you've never been able to have before. So what is the benefit from a to built perspective? The prog progress in digital technology for a farm business model like to built winery is really powerful. This is a really simple model, but this is the agricultural value chain, as simple as it is. And the benefit to Bilk is that we control 100% of the activity paddock to plate, which is quite unique for, uh, wine, for the wine industry, it's quite common. For a lot of industries, agricultural micro industries, it's not something you necessarily see. So at to Bilk, uh, we grow, we make, we sell. We do the full gamut. 
And um, I'll preface here our definition of customer when we're talking about a customer. We talk about that as the next person in the process. So that's both internally and externally. And simplistically, our external customers, they're our retail customers and our suppliers. And our internal customers are, are our employee groups. So say, for example, when we talk internally about data capture and servicing customers, when we're talking to the winery, their customer is the bottling line. So we expect them to deliver as high amount of service as they would if they were servicing an external customer. And we capture that data every step of the way. I'm not sure if this will work. Oh, it did, there you go. Um, so we capture data at every step, which is pretty powerful for us. It means that we can be really adaptive in the way that we grow our business internally and make this strategic decisions. Um, and I'll just add that for us, uh, blockchain technology is really exciting with how we could utilise that whole value chain system and better share data across um, our industry that sits within that bracket and also the agricultural service industry, because we do use a lot of service providers as well. So this is generally, when it comes to using digital technology, this is the process we follow across the whole business to make decisions. And I'll just highlight here that data is only one part of the decision-making process. We always look to validate our customer data with external research and then test our assumptions through prototyping, which I know is a bit of a buzzword, but essentially just testing it in the marketplace before we actually go ahead. We never solely rely on data analytics to give us the full story. We always test and validate before we go ahead to the next stage, which is around predictive analysis and making sure that we are then targeting our market or marketing or our brand, particularly to our customers. And the outcome of this process has been better strategic decision making and targeted marketing communication, both internal and external. The way we speak to people who might with work within our wine company business, which is our distribution arm of the business, is completely different to the way that we would talk to people who work in our vineyards because the level of knowledge and understanding of different topics is so diverse. So we view this as a way that we gather data and communication across the whole business, internal and external. So I thought it might be uh, useful to throw in an example of when we've made a big positive change uh, based on a combination of passion, I have a passion for environment, meets data intelligence and meets research validation. So for me, the best place to be is when you're passionate about something and your customers are passionate about the same thing. So in 2014, Tabilk became an accredited carbon neutral winery under the Carbon Zero certification. It's an international certification and it's currently the highest level of accreditation available in the global marketplace. Uh, it certifies you under the three most common standards that exist globally, which is the international standards, the NCOS, which is the Australian carbon standards, and the PAS standards, which are the uh, English European standards. You cannot enter uh, export markets for us as a brand without having that international PAS and uh, international standards over overlaying the brand. The NCOS is just not enough. The motivation was driven from a number of levels. Uh, we really pride ourselves on walk, working towards what we call a sustainable business model, and this is it in front of you. Again, pretty basic, but keeping it simple has been the key to our success. Um, and it's absolutely central to our success. So we, we very much look at the triple bottom line, people, profit, planet, however you want to describe that triple bottom line, that's what we aim to achieve. And our family has always placed a really high value on our role as custodians of the land. And we've completed a significant amount of revegetation activity on the property. But it wasn't until 2008, with the signing of the Kyoto Protocol and the Gano Review, that really piked our ears up and the possibility of an emissions trading scheme. We saw the opportunity to participate as as a way to complete our first carbon audit, just to see where we were at as an organisation. At that time, we thought possibly everybody would have to measure their footprint. We were wrong, but it certainly gave us a lot of powerful data to work with. So, 
At this time, our customer data, so this is back in 2008, was giving us really mixed messages about the value they placed on climate change and carbon. The media was awash with negativity and our core demographic, which I'll add is, has not really shifted that much. We've all just aged a little bit. Uh, it was 55-year-old Liberal voters, men, not interested in climate change. So we started to commence searching for external data to either confirm or deny our initial thoughts around what our customers were telling us around environment. And this is one of the articles that really sparked my interest. It was called The Generation Gap on Climate Change. It was an ABC uh, piece of research that they did with their uh, readers and listeners. And the statistics identified on a high level that only 50% of the population had climate change on the radar, but when you delved deeper, in fact, it was a growing issue for younger generations, which you can see down the bottom. So our target demographic at that time is the 55 to 65 plus. So if we listen to what they were telling us, we would do nothing. But if we go up the line to the 18 and 24 year olds, who viewed it as 70%, found that it was an important issue and looked at those people as being customers of the future, we thought we'd be on the right track. So at the time, we parked our carbon ambitions and we continued working on our environmental projects. We just thought the time is not right for accreditation. Let's just leave that and keep working through our revegetation and other environmental works that we had been doing at the time. And every year, we asked our customers to score their top issues through our data collection. That was across the whole business. Our employees, our retail customers, our suppliers, we asked them all the same question. What are your top issues right now? And it wasn't until 2014 when a Swedish tender opportunity reared its head that looking for a carbon accredited wine um, that we completed our first official audit and we haven't looked back since that point. We've found that our annual carbon accreditation process is as much about giving us a benchmark to measure our environmental investment as it is about achieving the outcomes we want. And we just took our European customers as being a flag to indicate what our Australian customers might like in the future. They soon, we thought, might demand the same level of accreditation and um, trust in their products and services. So this is what it looks like now. This is in 2016. So 10 years on, since first looking at uh, measuring and acting on our carbon footprinting exercise, we can see that this is, the decision was definitely right. The data was right. This is not a passing trend. In fact, it will become an expectation of all Australian businesses that they should not only be doing good for the environment, as someone mentioned earlier in the earlier panel, that they should also be socially responsible. So for us, while we're betting down our environmental credentials, we're already thinking about what should we be doing as a business to be more socially responsible, because I truly believe that the 18 to 35-year-olds listed there, they will be expecting that in the not too distant future. Um, these 18 to 35 year olds are our future customer in every sense. They will be working in our businesses and they will be servicing our industry. So to see that they place a high value on understanding climate change and accepting that climate change is human induced is um, a huge opportunity for us as a business who has that at the core of our brand. So as the new generation moves into leadership within their own businesses, we see huge opportunities as a brand, which is invested in creating a healthier environment, a healthier planet, and partner them with to completely reshape our value chain, utilising digital technology to do so. So we are changing the way that we go to market, using our marketing voice to attract buyers instead of using our marketing to sell. Hopefully this example displays that for us, the benefit of digital technology has been the ability to turn data into meaningful decision making. So this is my fam. I love them. Um, before I close, you might be asking yourself, because I know that my topic involved profitability, because hey, we're all concerned about profit at the end of the day, and you wouldn't just invest in the environment if there wasn't at least a moderated profit outcome. So is investing in the environment profitable? 
Now, I just want to be completely clear. If you're planning on investing in the environment purely for a short-term outcome, you are absolutely fooling yourself. We do have some checks and balances. If you go right back to our sustainability model, we only in complete environmental activity if it's bearable on our people and if it's viable from the bottom line perspective. And so long as those projects tick those boxes, they go, at, go ahead and nine out of 10 projects do. Environmental sustainability is not for our generation. It's for the next one and the next one after that. And it's easy for me to say that from a multiple generation perspective, but I honestly look at my children in this slide and I think if I want to create a strong farming future for them, this is the way that we need to go. So getting back onto topic, before I close, uh, my key messages are this. Use data technology to enhance your decision making. Listen, capture and validate customer data to stay relevant. Invest in brand, it is way more important than your marketing. And look to long-term profitability. And can digital technology transform farm marketing? The answer is yes, it already has. Thank you very much.